Hi, this is Harry Margolis with Estate Planning 101. This program, we're going to talk about family protection trust. And these trusts, as we'll discuss, are a really nifty feature of the law, at least from a lawyer's point of view, that allows you to protect anything you leave to your children and grandchildren from many of the pred predations of modern life. So unfortunately, even before COVID-19 and climate change, uh, this is a dangerous, has been a dangerous world for uh, people with any funds. So uh, those funds can be lost to lawsuits, divorce, bankruptcy, bad decisions, disability, or uh, early death, meaning say you leave your funds, uh, your state to your children, um, and they pass away while your grandchildren are still minors, uh, the surviving spouse gets uh, remarried, and uh, who knows where those funds end up, not necessarily with your grandchildren. So um, it's hard to protect your own funds. There are ways to do that from, from all these uh, potential risks, but it's not so hard to protect the funds that you leave to your uh, children and grandchildren. So uh, um, you can protect them, or at least you can protect them financially. So, um, as, as I said, it's difficult to protect your own funds, and the way to protect funds for your children and grandchildren so that they are protected is through a specially designed trust. Now, these uh, trusts have different names. Sometimes they're called spendthrift trusts. Sometimes they're called generation skipping trusts. The, uh, they're called spendthrift trusts uh, very often because of really just one clause that's in all these trusts that says, that the beneficiary of the trust can't pledge the trust assets for a debt. So it's basically, so these trusts have always been around as a way to protect people who are uh, not necessarily the wisest spenders from overspending their money. They're also called generation skipping trusts because you may make the trust for your grandchildren rather than your children or for your children during their lives and the, but not for them to have total control and for it then to pass to the grandchildren and uh, so that it's a, in effect skips a generation and there's a whole tax structure around that because rich people would use that a, as a way to avoid taxation on their funds both when they die and then again when their children die and uh, uh, when they were all setting up these trusts congress uh, thought they were getting away with too much so now there's a very complicated generation skipping trust but for most people, that doesn't matter because the federal state tax only kicks in when you're, if you're a single individual, when your state is over $11.5 million. And if you're a married couple, when it's over $23 million and the generation skipping uh, tax rules have the same thresholds. Uh, so 99.9% .9 of Americans don't need to worry about the generation skipping rules anymore. Now, we prefer to call these trusts family protection trusts because that's really what they're there for. They're to provide a buffer um, from uh, anything that may happen to the family, to have some funds that are protected um, for them and available to them if needed, often with the idea that this, the, these funds are not going to provide their living expenses, but really some protection. Now, the issue and the, and the challenge is how do you design these trusts so that they do what they uh, what you want them to do, again, providing this uh, buffer or uh, some kind of insurance money without creating too much trouble and expense. Now, the best way and the strongest way to draft these trusts is to uh, put my, your funds in trust for the benefit of your children and to name an independent trustee, say a bank or a trust company or a law firm to manage the funds and determine how and when they will be distributed to the beneficiaries. Now, a lot of people don't want that for a number of reasons. One, uh, they don't want to give up so much control. Number two, they don't want to pay for it. I mean, professional trustees generally charge about 1% per year, which I think is well-earned, but it, over time that can add up. So, um, so a lot of people, as I said, want to avoid that. So the weakest way to, to um, draft one of these trusts is to name the beneficiary as the trustee, but in the trust instrument to restrict their access to the funds. 
uh, to say, well, may only be used, say, for their health, education, and maintenance, but not for their free spending of money. That's probably not, that. I say that's weakest, it's probably too weak to make these trusts of uh, much use if it's written like that. Because in general, if you can get to the trust funds, so can your creditors. Um, and uh, so can your divorcing spouse as well. So that's probably a little too weak. So what we've come up with is something of a hybrid uh, that we think is a, has proved to be a happy balance for a lot of clients. So we do name the beneficiary as the trustee. So if you leave your funds to your son, Buster, he can be the trustee. He can manage the investments. He can withdraw the, in, the, the income, the interest and the dividends. Uh, or if he invests in rental property, he can, he can withdraw the rental income, but he can't access the principal. So if he wants to dip into the principal, he, he, at that point, he has to appoint an independent trustee. So the independent trustee then would share with all the, all the management duties and could, in, in its discretion, distribute the principal. So this works, at least on paper, but take some education because the reality is if Buster does wants to withdraw the principal, nobody's going to stop him from doing that. The trust says he's not allowed to do that as the sole trustee, but if the money's sitting in a bank and he writes a check from the bank funds, the bank doesn't know that he's violating the terms of the trust at that point. And if he starts violating the terms of the trust, then it loses its protection because Again, if he's using the money freely, um, his creditors can access it as well, or his spouse on, in the event of divorce can also access it. So it's a little bit risky, this um, approach, but we try to make it work through education and to try to explain to the trustee that he must follow the rules if it's going to work. And uh, if he decides he doesn't care about the protection, I suppose he can break those rules, but he's giving up the structure that's been created by his, his parents. So depending on the situation, clients choose to do it in this fashion, or if they have a child who really does need the protection and really can't be trusted to manage the funds himself and to follow the trust rules, then they go with an independent trustee. Um, but as I said at the beginning, I think of this as a pretty nifty tool um, that's on, that the law allows for families to protect assets for uh, for their um, for their children and their grandchildren, especially their grandchildren, because even where you have the the child as their own trustee, if they pass away or they become disabled, the trust protects the assets for them and then ultimately for the for the grandchildren. So as we have listed on this slide, there's a lot of information about this and other state planning concepts on our website at markolis.com. And on my other website at askharry.info, we have uh, lots more information on state planning, and I also answer questions that consumers post at no charge.